good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pete Eberly with the Northern Chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. Um, we're going to go ahead and just do a couple quick announcements before we get things started with Max and Jean um, to talk about the Great Montava Project. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with CRESS, um, CRESS and its local chapters provide education, policy advocacy, and community engagement that accelerate Colorado towards a carbon neutral future powered by 100% renewable energy. Founded in 1996, CRESS is a statewide nonpartisan 50C1 not-for-profit um, that is supported by our sustaining individual as well as our business sponsors. Um, speaking of which, I do want to give some special recognition to our uh, business sponsors, which include Moss Adams, Hooter Valley Rural Electric Association, and Vista Engineering Group. Uh, in terms of upcoming events, um, we do have a couple lined up here. Um, coming up on Thursday, August 25th at 7 p.m. in Golden, Colorado, our uh, Golden Chapter will have discussion on the Colorado River crisis featuring conservation bi biologist Rob Schillerbeck. Um, this is going to be an in-person but it's also going to be a streamed event. We also have coming up on September 14th which is a Wednesday um, 7 p.m. in Boulder, Colorado uh, will be the future of transportation and energy in Colorado with Dr. R. Paul Williamson. Um, this event will be at the TU campus uh, at 7 p.m. Um, in order to get more information on those events, just go to cres-energy.org and events. So Cres-energy.org uh, and then go to the events tab and you'll be able to uh, sign up for the meetup um, and for the, uh, the event in Golden, uh, there's a link to sign up for the live stream. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to uh, Max Moss of H2FM. If I got that wrong, I apologize. I do a lot of <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it down, darn it. That's right. That's good. You were and, darn uh, close. And then <laughs> Gene Myers of, uh, of Thrive Builders. So thanks again for this. Um, it's always a pleasure to to share any venue with Gene Meyer, um, my friend and and hero in all of this effort. And he's been with us from the very beginning of the Montava journey, which has been five years. And so what I'm gonna do is just kind of walk through, um, well, what would be a presentation, but here it kind of looks like a PDF document um, that just describes, kind of scratches the surface on Montava. And you can think of the community as we're building the stadium and we're kind of setting the rules and Gene is the player on the field, and he's the guy that's gonna be making homes happen and doing a lot of, of really hard stuff that we don't do. But um, the things I'm gonna be talking to you about tonight are gonna be about the stadium itself and just making sure that we're building a place that's really a great venue for people. And one of the ways we think about that is we think about it's a place where people would love to visit and want to visit more than once, not just live. I love this phrase that I saw, but what can I do? I'm just one person, said seven billion people. Um, kind of speaks for itself. But when you're facing big challenges like this, whether it's affordable housing or a large community like this that has a lot of different innovative aspects to it, sometimes you can get worn out and you can you know, feel like you're fighting such an uphill battle that you ask yourself, is it worth it? But our team is heavily involved in affordable housing development. And I remember asking Caleb Roop one time, you know, is this all worth it when you're just making such a small dent in the problem? Because the problem of affordable housing for people is, is severe. And Caleb said, absolutely, we're going to make a difference in the life of one family and one person at a time. And it's, it's meaningful for them. So I've remembered that. Um, some of the first principles of Montava, just big picture stuff. We'll talk about this in the presentation. Um, we use this phrase systematic sustainability. I think systematically about everything and I think you'll see there's just a lot of connected themes throughout this whole discussion about what Montava is and how it's pieced together uh, that creates a system that comes back to 
carbon reduction, sustainability, sustainability, energy conservation, water conservation, great livability. All these things are connected in a system, and hopefully you'll see that. Um, beauty, simplicity, and urbanism. Again, all these things are connected to each other. You'll probably hear me say a lot how important making things beautiful is. I think we've lost that in a lot of development. Um, we're doing our darndest um, to, to bring that to bear in every aspect of what we do with Montava. Active mobility is a huge component of the community. So is overall health, water, and soil. And I'll discuss that with you. Um, farming, food, uh, enable local everything. And I'm gonna pass it on to Gene when I get to electrification. One of the things that, that I've been educated on in this process over the last five years with our team members who are really world-class urbanists from around the world, um, Lou Oliver in particular, who's an architect in the Atlanta area that's just been in this space for a long time. Lou has really taught me the beauty of simplicity in architecture and lots of things. So it's one of the themes of what we're doing with Montava in terms of how we're approaching the architecture of the homes, commercial spaces, streetscapes, um, public areas, as we really focus on simplicity and beauty. Uh, here's some of here's some cottage homes. That's Lou in the bottom right hand corner there that kind of tell the same story. Not a lot of complication in these homes, but just beautiful form, beautiful proportion, um, high quality inside, and just giving people a different living experience in some of the ways that we approach these home designs. These are some things that you'll see in Montava. We have a wide, wide variety of housing types in the community. Um, urbanism. So what is urbanism? How does it play in? Why does it matter? Um, this is actually showing, uh, this is actually cutting off something. Um, this was a quote that I really liked and, it, and it's something that we kind of live by, that, that our job is not just to give people what they want, it's to think about what they would want if they knew what they should want. And there's a lot of how we build community in the United States over the last several decades that's, that's lost some specialness to it. And we're trying to do what we can um, within the confines of reality to bring specialness back and beauty back. This is a little diagram by a guy named Leon Creer, who's a famous urbanist. Um, Leon has built incredible communities around the world with Prince Charles and many others. And it's kind of self-evident. You can see the mature city on the top. You can think of that as Fort Collins and how Fort Collins is gonna grow. Kind of the traditional way that we tend to grow in America is we have vertical and horizontal overexpansion. We make the, the mature city too big and then we sprawl. And that tends to be economically driven where the real right emphasis and the right way to, to grow from an urbanist perspective is organic expansion through duplication. And it's the way we've approached Montava uh, from the beginning, mainly because it was Fort Collins goals but the opportunity is very unique for us in Northeast Fort Collins. And, and I'll show you that at the very end of the presentation to create a self-sufficient community that is not that's walkable and bikeable because it has it's, it's completely self-sufficient in its services and its health care and its food production and food services um, where you don't have to get in a car to go anywhere. And that's what's one of the unique things about the project. This is another way of looking at the same thing where, you know, Oftentimes, not not all the time. I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to criticize the hard work that a lot of people do to bring housing to a to a desperate market that needs housing. But we do tend to create sprawl that requires us to drive. I do it every day. You know, I drive from Windsor to Fort Collins every day. So I'm one of these people that does this. I look forward to living in Montalvo one day, so I don't have to do that. But what we're really shooting for is is this a different standard, you know, where the, the suburban sprawl standard, there really is no measure of how far you, you can live from where you work because you just get in your car and you drive, where, you know, the urbanist has a standard of walkability and how far can you walk in 10 or 15 minutes. And that changes the paradigm of how you design community. Healthy urbanism, the effect is measured in walking and biking. Gentle density is another term that you hear uh, described in urbanism. Bottom line is it's a math equation. You know, you, you, don't, you don't build a convenience store in a cul-de-sac and you've gotta have people and you have to have the, enough density of people 
to be able to create beautiful walkable places you know, people tend to think about Europe, and on the left-hand side here, you see old buildings and narrow passage in and, and a European city that, you know, millions of people flock to Europe to experience those kind of communities. On the right, you see a, a little pathway between homes that was designed and built by Lou Oliver uh, outside of Atlanta in a community called Trillith. And beauty can be created today, and beautiful places can be created today um, with focused effort and the right team. So we'll move on to active mobility. So um, I think one of the themes that you'll see in Montava, I'm just touching on it here, is we really want to control traffic with infrastructure, not with rules or enforcement. So as opposed to, you know, big speedways and lights and hoping that everybody stops and they're not on their phone when they're supposed to, we want to control traffic very much from a Dutch perspective with infrastructure, with road design, um, in a way that is really meaningful. And unfortunately, I've got a video here that isn't gonna work because this, for some reason, technology isn't working. Um, but in essence, um, the mission here is to slow cars down substantially and to do that naturally with infrastructure, force people to look at each other, force people to have eye contact and interactions. And that personal interaction at low speeds is where safety comes. If you were able to see this video, what you'd see is over 50 years, the Netherlands has reduced fatalities of all three modes of transportation to exactly the same at a very low level over the last 50 years. And they've done it with infrastructure. They haven't just done it with rules and enforcement. They've done it with how they build their roads, how they build their bike lanes. And what we've done in Montava is we've hired a firm called Mobicon, which is a Dutch-based planning firm. And those guys really help us vision, envision what's possible. They look over our shoulder on everything we're doing from an engineering perspective. This happens to be a, a pedestrian and bike uh, prioritized roundabout that's designed in the middle of Montava. That's the community park on the bottom right-hand side. Our, our uh, Western community irrigation pond would be on the left. The town center is up toward the bottom, upper right. And so we're working with Mobicon to design Dutch-based systems that um, will be somewhat unique for the United States, but um, beautiful, functional, and slowing cars down. And you know, we we basically this is a this is a city in Canada, and we'd say the same thing that infrastructure and the infrastructure we build needs to be beautiful, functional, and sustainable. And um, I think you can see all three of those components in this uh, beautiful picture of this downtown center in Canada. Uh, this is a community called Norton Commons. Um, Norton Commons in Kentucky. It's one of the most popular um, communities um, on the East Coast in terms of its growth and, and people buying into it. It's a DPZ community. Uh, Gowani Plater Zyber, they're the planners of Montava. It's been one of my examples of communities to really look at for how we design what we design. And I think when you look at this picture on the bottom right hand side, you get a real sense for, you get a systematic sense here. What you're looking at here is community connection. You're looking at people focused versus car centric. You don't have a big garage door in the front of your house. You've got a patio that's slightly elevated above the sidewalk. You've got very little grass to irrigate. So your irrigation, your water is certainly conserved versus the house that I currently live in with a big old yard that we have to irrigate multiple times a week. Um, beautiful front porch. So you've got a lot of things that are connected to conservation and people focus and architecture here that you see systematically in these kinds of homes. And people are very attracted to this kind of thing and it's different. Um, moving on to health, water and soil. So the questions that we ask ourselves, the goals that we set for ourselves chart our course. That sounds cliche, but it's true. Some of the questions that we ask ourselves as we go through this process of planning Montava is how does the Pareto principle apply to water conservation? Um, I'm going to get to that in a second, but I'm a big believer in the Pareto principle. How can we make Montaba the biggest carbon sink that it can be? How can we significantly improve our soil long term 
which is connected both to beauty, it's connected to maintenance, it's connected to car being a carbon sink, it's connected to irrigation conservation. I only make that point because you can see how improving our soils connected to multiple things in the project in a systematic way. But doing all those things economically, they have to be economical. This can't just be a community that's for the super wealthy and they're the only ones that can live there and they're required to make it work. So those are the kind of questions we ask ourselves. And Pareto's principle is one of the most powerful things that, that drive me in terms of how I think about things. And it, it essentially says that the most important 20% of our effort produces 80% of our most important results. So said a different way, Focus on the 20% of things that are going to deliver you 80% of your most valuable results. And it's that last 20% that's the hardest to get to. And you generally spend 80% of your effort trying to get the last 20%. So we do a lot of questioning, asking ourselves, what are the, what are the things we really need to focus on to get 80% of the value? And I'm using water as an example. So in water conservation, um, one of those 20% that we can focus on that gives us huge value is information. I'm a big believer that people in Colorado live in Colorado because they love the outdoors, they're conservation oriented, and you give them good information and they'll make better decisions. You know, whenever we don't really do people a lot of good when we send them a water bill that has a frowny face on it and says, you know, you were a bad boy last month, you used 10,000 gallons of water. If we give people real-time information so that they know what that irrigation cycle that they just ran through actually used, what that big bath that they just took actually used, um, you know, how much their washing machine is using, you give people good information and they're going to be able to make better decisions. And I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. Community conservation. I just showed you a picture a minute ago um, of Norton Commons where you had small yards in communities like Montava, the least efficient from an irrigation standpoint of water use is individual homes. The most efficient is large common spaces that are professionally managed and professionally taken care of. And most of the time that's because we as homeowners don't tend to really know what's happening and, and what we should be doing. So we often overwater or have an irrigation system that's irrigating the, you know, the driveway or the sidewalk. And so in communities like what we're doing, the, the community conservation is having lots of open space, having lots of park space, having smaller yards that are easier to take care of and require less water, um, just as one of the big ideas. And then homes built to conserve. There's many, many ways that we can build a home to conserve water and you wouldn't even know it in terms of being the homeowner and the livable experience. So that's how the Pareto principle applies to water. I mentioned soil. We're spending a lot of time talking about soil, um, how improving biomass and plant production um, based on how we treat the soil and improve the soil overall in the community, whether that's in the 150 to 200 acres of natural areas and farm, whether it's in the 100 plus acres of parks that we have in Montava, or whether it's on the, the, the um, lawns, trees, um, tree lawns that are you know, common to the streets. How do we maintain the soil the best possible way so that we're capturing as much carbon as we can, making things more beautiful and just making the earth better um, one square foot at a time? And does it matter? Yes, it matters. Uh, it's, you know, are we gonna change the world? No, but we'll change the area that we live in and we'll help people understand how, they're, how the way they live makes a difference in, in, um, in the earth that we're all trying to take care of. One thing that we did as an example that we're doing right now, actually, we built a test garden out on Montava where we're um, trying out community plants and grass and a variety of things uh, with using the groundwater that we have out there. And we're testing a product called Gynate, which adds a lot of organic material in the soil beyond just what's required from a compost standpoint um, added to the soil with our clay soil. So we're focusing on testing different things and seeing what kind of improvements we can make with with not just creating what we do up front for the soils in Montalvo, but how do we carry those things out systematically over time as the Metro District, for example, and the HOA manages those processes and helps people manage their own yards and we manage the common spaces. So soil is really important. Agri-urban community. Um, when I first started this project, Fort Collins had been planning it for decades. They said, we want, you know, we want this area to be agri-urban. Nobody really knew what that meant. 
So I went around the country and I visited communities um, all over the place uh, that have active farms as part of their community. And I'd ask the developer and I'd ask the farmer, you know, the same questions. What went right? What went wrong? What would you do different? If you were me here in Fort Collins, what would you do? And just learn some really brilliant things. The first thing we learned is developers suck at farming. And so everywhere that a, that a developer controls the farm in an agri-urban community, it fails. So you have to find local farmers. And that's one of the first things we did was, was partner with Nick and Katie with Native Hill Farms. And that's been one of the greatest experiences in my last five years. Find the best soil in the project. Um, we told Nick and Katie, go out and find the best soil. And that's where the farm's going to be. And we'll build the community around it. So where the farm is right now is the best soil in the project. And then connect it to the community. One of the things I saw when I traveled around the country and talked to these people is they really didn't have a great connection to the community. They, you know, they may have a great farm stand, they have great products, but when you move to Montaba, everyone who moves to Montaba is going to be paying $10, $12 a month into the farm and you'll get it 100% in food credit or you can take it as a tax write-off or you can take it as a farm dinner at the end of the year, but you're going to come into Montaba and you're going to participate in this farming lifestyle and connecting that to the farm, which will be really valuable for people. So again, really focusing on what are those things that we can do that make the biggest difference. Enable local everything. So I threw my daughter in here as a shameless plug because she's really amazing person and she runs an Instagram page in Fort Collins. It's called Life in NoCo. I'm often, whenever I'm having coffee or dinner somewhere, they will say, are you Emily Life in NoCo's dad? And I'll say, yes, I am. But uh, Emily and her husband, their whole lives are um, um, basically putting out their uh, local businesses and sharing local businesses with the community on a large scale, supporting them with marketing and things like that. And when we are turning our attention to our biggest amenities in Montava are our town center to make the community walkable and bikeable and also our farm. And my focus is to have local coffee, local brewery, um, local bakery. I'm not looking for national brands. I'm looking for great, successful local partners who can participate in helping build this community. And people like Emily are who make that possible. You know, consequently, our town center is going to look like this, as opposed to kind of a traditional commercial environment that most people are used to with the big grocery anchored shopping center. We're going to be focused on bringing smaller scale, people oriented, people scaled um, products to the table that are beautiful, that are architecturally um, common and, and fit well with the Montava uh, architecture and provide people a really wonderful experience. And, I'm, and this is not easy to do, and, uh, but this is where much of my effort personally is focused on. So then, you take, then the, as we close this out, and I'm getting to the end here, um, how do all those things come to bear in Montava? So hopefully this will work. So here's the farm that we talked about earlier. That's a 40 acre farm. Um, oh shoot, let's see. Yeah, that'll be easier. All right, so here's a, this is a, and that, and that. All right, there we go. That's a hundred acre community park, elementary school. Here's our town center right here. So connecting these three things, the community park, the town center and elementary school, that kind of life is really was really important for me to create that kind of energy and connectivity in the community. This is um, 140 or 50 acres of natural areas that we're partnering with Fort Collins Natural Areas Organization to make what would just normally be storm drainage, beautiful open space with trails and natural areas as many of you experience in Fort Collins now. We've, we've swapped land um, with the school district or will when we close the property with the school district to make this a high school and middle school here. They currently own this parcel and we swapped land with them to do that there. Um, so, you, you know, there's more here, but you start to get a sense for how the community reflects these principles that I've been sharing with you. Um, natural areas, soil, water conservation, things like that. Um, oops, back to sharing screen, turn that off. 
this is just focusing a little bit more uh, in detail, but I shared that. Big picture, last couple of slides, we we really embrace this 15 minute city concept, the concept of, of walkable and bikeability, not just for Montavo, but for the entire Northeast Fort Collins. In this mile and a half radius, we made the town center, the very center of this mile and a half radius. There's about 9,000 people that currently live in that radius. And we are creating a system, a bikeable, walkable system, not only in Montavo, but the rest of the community as well, where people are gonna be able to have a great experience to be, to be able to get to your grocery store, your coffee shop, your bakery, your place to hang out, your park. And um, that's one of the major emphasis of the, the design that we've worked with the city on and redesigning the master street plan to make sure that that's main and main. Um, just a rendering that shows the central town center to help us kind of visualize how we're doing this and what we're doing. Another picture, very common. You, if you see what's happening on Linden Street in Fort Collins, this will look very similar to that. It's amazing. Now I'm going to kick it over to Gene. At the end of the day, we're going to have to build homes that people buy and live here. And uh, as we move into electrification, um, that can't happen without people like Gene and our other partner builders that we're working with. And uh, Gene, I look forward to hearing what you have to share in terms of the home building. Well, um, hello everybody. Thank you for inviting Max and me to talk with you. Um, I am uh, always amazed when I get Max has uh, accomplished the uh, entitlement of the project, and I can't wait to see how it is uh, coming to life. Beyond energy efficiency, and the reason I came up with that title is we've been an energy efficient builder for some time. Um, in November, it will have been 30 years since I started uh, out as a home builder on my own, and I started off as a green builder. And way back then, it was the public service company of Colorado Ideal Energy Home which was overtaken by Energy Star, which was overtaken in my view by the Department of Energy Zero Energy, Zero Energy Ready Home uh, Program. Since Energy Star, we've uh, used uh, the HERS score, the Home Energy Rating System from ResNet. And in uh, last year, we were named the most energy efficient production builder in the US and Canada. I'm claiming Mexico, so, uh, um, and then last year, or, or this year, we were named the most efficient production builder uh, before solar. And I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, how we see solar playing in the uh, realm of carbon reduction, which is uh, our current focus. Um, in the efficiency world, um, in the Zero Energy Ready Home Program, they hand out grand awards for housing innovation, and we've won at least one of those every year that that award has been offered. And uh, we are uh, the largest builder of net zero energy homes in the state. Healthy is another aspect, an attribute of our homes, and it's also a part of the DOE Zero Energy Ready Program. You have to comply with EPA and Door Air Plus. And uh, I'll be honest with you, when we uh, launched this in about 2014, I think maybe, um, people kind of would look at me cross-eyed about what the heck does health have to do with the home? And uh, over time, we've learned how to communicate that. I love this image that we have in our uh, sales offices, uh, just helping people understand that, oh, wait, air actually is important. So it's indoor air quality, which we're selling as health. Um, and um, I love the, the image because it's kind of a visceral image. It's a thing our customer cares most about, their children and uh, we get to talk to them about uh, what we can do to improve their lives. When the pandemic hit, it seemed like our customers got it. And so uh, we were ready when that happened. And I think that's been a really important uh, brand attribute for us. Local is uh, 
you know, we're a small builder. Uh, we build between one and 200 homes a year. We are, we just broke ground in Fort Collins uh, last week and we have uh, 220 units at a project called Saunders and we can't wait for Max to come out of the ground and be a big part of uh, Montava. Um, we're green. Um, this is a house that um, won best in green at the International Builder Show, Green Home of the Year magazine. And uh, this one is uh, hers of zero, uh, a net zero energy uh, as a result of conservation. It's a double two by four wall home with, uh, I think about a nine kilowatt uh, solar array and a, a, a battery, a bank of batteries as well. Uh, this one really came home to us uh, just, you know, just within the last few months. This was a picture of the Marshall Fire that happened in uh, Superior in Louisville in Boulder County. Who knew that uh, the defensible space around a house could be 20 miles to the nearest pine tree and we'd still have these problems. These are climate events and what uh, was striking about this to me, the townhomes in the foreground were ours. And the one on the end there was our model home. And I just knew when I saw this uh, news footage that it would be a total loss. And miraculously, we didn't lose a single home. And I believe it has a lot to do with airtight construction, using the right materials, and I'll also take uh, the grace of God along the way because it really, when you look at an aerial, it's just miraculous that not a single one of our homes was touched. We had about 30 of these occupied and about 20 under construction. So we're, but it has caused us to be much more focused going forward on uh, factoring in uh, re uh, resiliency into our homes uh, as we design them. Uh, and now we're moving to carbon neutrality. And it's kind of a personal story. Uh, I was in the lockdown for the pandemic as we all were, and I was sitting here in my home office. And if I look out to the West, I've got a beautiful view of the mountains. And we start with the pandemic and we're shut in, but at least we can go outside. And by the end of that summer, the smoke was so bad from the forest fires and I know up in Fort Collins, you live through the same thing, if not worse. And it, a couple of things occurred to me. One was uh, maybe home is the last stand, you know? Uh, having that healthy indoor air uh, meant a lot. And I have to tell you that the filtration system, when I changed the filters after all of that, it was a shocking thing to see what did not get into my indoor air. But it occurred to me that maybe instead of being so focused on efficient, healthy, and local, maybe what we should really be about is the health of our customers and the health of the planet. And that caused me to start kind of a thought process of, well, what could a builder do? By the way, Max, I loved that quote about what can one person do, said 7 billion people. Well, I don't know how many builders there are in the country, uh, thousands, but what could one little builder do? And uh, the answer to that question for me all these years has been, well, we can do all we can. I don't think we're called to save the world, but we are called to do our part. And so we started trying to envision how do we affect climate change and would our customers pay for it? Um, we're a small builder. If, if our customers won't pay for it, we don't get to do it. And so this was a house that we designed uh, during the uh, lockdown. And we finished it in 2020. And it's, uh, this house has HEPA filtration, so it actually can filter out the coronavirus. Um, it is a net zero energy house. It's all electric. There are no fossil fuels in the house. Uh, and so as a net zero house with no fossil fuels from an operational standpoint, 
uh, annually, it's a zero emission house. And this was kind of our first test uh, for what could we do. And it's been really, uh, really gratifying that this house has also won a lot of design awards. I'll be honest with you, we don't win a lot of design awards because we spend so much money but behind the walls. But um, this one got a platinum Best in American Living Award at the International Builder Show. And uh, the reference there uh, to the Gold Nugget Award for Home of the Year, there were 600 entries in that uh, competition. And I was stunned when they gave us that award because that's always been a glitz and glamour award. From my standpoint, it's in California. We're, we're, this was in a category of houses from 2,500 to 3,000 feet. And guess what? A, a California house in that size range might cost $4 million. And guess which one has more glitz and glamour and more bling? And yet the judges came out and said that it's time that the industry recognizes that beauty must be more than skin deep. Uh, in dealing with the issues of climate change. So I, I'm, I'm really proud that maybe we, maybe we got to wake up a little bit of the industry that it's very important that these homes play a role in this. So our carbon reduction goals, uh, first are to benchmark and offset the carbon footprint of our corporate oper operations. Some of you may be familiar with this term ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance. This is all about the UN uh, climate goals and Glasgow and Paris. Uh, the SEC has a requirement now that all public companies need to come up with an ESG report. Uh, we're not public, but we do feel like um, someday capital will flow to companies that are uh, uh, up to date on this. And so we'll publish our first ESG report this year. The second is to eliminate the operational carbon emissions. And I mentioned in the, the slide before on that house that that's how you do it. You take the fossil fuels out of the house and then you make it net zero energy. Um, our goal is that by the end of next year, every house we build will have a zero operational car carbon footprint. And then finally, and the most gnarly issue of all is to quantify and offset the embodied carbon of all of our homes. And uh, here's the way we're thinking about this, that a home is the most resource intensive product that anyone ever buys. And it has a big uh, carbon footprint. And uh, we really ought to be focusing on reducing that footprint to the maximum extent possible, and then purchasing an offset so that we can look at Fort Collins, for example, that has a very aggressive uh, carbon reduction goal of their own in their climate action plan and say, well, this is how we do it in our industry to help you get where you wanna go and to help our customers. I think our customers care about this uh, and to help them be a part of the solution. We have come up with a term for this uh, called Thrive Carbon Wise. And why would we do that? Well, um, we have to find a way to communicate this with customers. And uh, so kind of creating a uh, brand around it is one way to do that. Uh, and I'll just kind of diverge a little bit. What's the value proposition for a customer? And here's my take. My take is that people are increasingly aware of climate change. We've lived through wildfires. We've lived through our pine beetle epidemic that's wiped out millions of acres of forest. Uh, we're, we're grappling with a, a climate emergency with uh, the 1200 year drought that is front page news now. I'm sure you all saw where Arizona gets a 20% haircut next year on Colorado River water. We know what's happening in the west to the grid. It's becoming more and more unstable. And something that struck me when I was hearing the news reports about um, uh, Lake Powell and, um, and uh, uh, the dams along the uh, Colorado River that generate power, 
that they're getting to the point where they don't have enough head to drive the generators. And that's 11 million people that in the West that depend on uh, that power. And where we're headed is affecting people every day and will affect people every day. And I think there's also an awareness of why it's happening. You know, if you watch the PBS uh, Nature uh, and Nova presentations and uh, David Attenborough, the, the great nature broadcaster from Britain, uh, headlines from uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, everybody, I think, is aware or becoming aware that this is a serious, serious problem. But they are completely, I think they uh, have a complete sense of helplessness about what they can do about it. And so the appeal that we uh, will make to our customers will be um, that if you buy from us, you can have the peace of mind of knowing that you've done your part uh, with respect to the biggest uh, footprint of a product that you will ever buy. So um, I think that's going to be appealing. We've done that with health uh, successfully, where we've uh, kind of gelled that down to a message. It's the peace of mind of knowing you do, you've do you done all you can for the people you love. And I'm an engineer. I tend to be very product-oriented uh, and uh, feature-oriented. And I want to tell them that, uh, you know, our, our, our house has uh, MERV-13 filtration with activated carbon media. And what I've learned over all these years is that the customer really doesn't need to know what's in the house. We don't need to know what's in the iPhone. We just need to know that that iPhone is intuitive to use and, and uh, meets our needs. So uh, it's getting to those visceral uh, appeals of our product that we're offering peace of mind to our customers. And uh, that's how we plan to uh, launch this. I have a case study for you. It's about a 2,000 square foot ranch plan. Uh, this is the house that we dug the basement for uh, in Fort Collins last week. And so um, the first thing you have to do is you have to know what's in the house. And here's the truth of the matter. Builders don't necessarily know what goes into their houses. Uh, it's very often a case of what was the product in the pickup truck of the, of the subcontractor the day they showed up to work on this house. That particularly with res, uh, respect to uh, adhesives and uh, kind of consumables that go into the construction of the home. So we're using a BIM model, a building information management model, to uh, get down to every piece and part of the house. Uh, to the maximum extent that's practical. Um, and so you get this 3D model and the, uh, the BIM uh, software then, after you've designed this, can help you develop just a, what I call an excruciatingly detailed build materials. And so if we know exactly what goes into the house and, and this software has to not just do the structure of the house or the siding of the house. It's got to do the finishes of the house. And so it makes it really challenging to, um, if you want to make a change, it's, it's really a challenge to go, okay, well, what did that do? But nevertheless, that's where we're headed. Um, we came out on this house with 19,000 pieces and parts. And so if you ever wonder why construction defects are an issue, we kind of need all 19,000 parts to be installed properly. It's a challenging business and we do it outdoors. And uh, it was 443 different kinds of pieces and parts. And so you use that to then pair up each part with an environmental product declaration and then you add them up. Here's the rub. Not every product has an environmental product declaration. And so we're working right now on um, what's the proper calculation method. There are a number of calculation platforms out there. 
We're working with graduate students at the University of Denver to evaluate all of them and uh, come to a conclusion of what's the most appropriate platform to, to be used by a home builder. Our plan is to share that information. Uh, Green Builder Magazine is uh, featuring the house that we did this calculation on as, one, as their vision home for this year. Uh, and in fact, we're doing a photo op tomorrow up there for a groundbreaking for them to, to launch their information. And so we're gonna share our journey with the entire industry. We're also doing a demonstration house. Where we're gonna try some things I wouldn't test out on customers. And uh, our media partner there is Professional Builder Magazine. So the idea is uh, hopefully, if some builder it finds it attractive to follow in our footsteps, we'll we'll break the trail and share our knowledge about uh, what at least we think is the best uh, approach. We have a unique opportunity. Our uh, building information management partner is MyTech, which is a Berkshire Hathaway company. Um, they're best known for their uh, trust design software and, and products and the machinery that goes into to, uh, trust plants. Their goal is to develop a software suite where a house could be designed in their software and you could early on in the process of schematic design uh, do scenario planning for carbon at that point rather than having to wait to the end when you get uh, all of this uh, detailed information. Uh, this first one was done uh, in the EC3 uh, uh, platform that stands for embodied carbon of construction uh, components. It's a very, it looks very promising that this would be the best to use for a, a builder and what you see there along the right hand side is the relative footprint of all the various categories that went into the house. We're focused on the top two for obvious reasons. Uh, and the top one is concrete and the next one is OSB. Those are the most uh, carbon intensive products in our homes. And so we're searching for uh, alternatives to those materials. We have uh, identified a fiberglass foundation and fiberglass isn't exactly benign either because you have to melt glass to uh, do it but um, uh, this is Owens Corning fiber and uh, they've offset all the energy that they use in North America with wind so we get those credits the carbon credits that come with using that product and to offset um, the footprint of that material and then uh, with OSB, we're, uh, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, the OSB manufacturers are part of a trade association called the American Plywood Association, APA. And I've been invited to do a keynote address down there at their conference uh, in uh, October. And I asked them, are you sure that you, you want me to talk to them? And, I told them what we were doing and they basically said, let me get back with you. And they did. And they've said, you know, our people need to know that they better, um, they better innovate or they might just be innovated right out of a, a, a more carbon aware construction industry. So, you know, people are noticing what we're doing and I hope we're, we're getting a message out that's important. So relatively speaking, uh, the blue area of this graph is uh, over time uh, this is going from now out to 2051 what the uh, operational carbon looks like and that embodied carbon is the orange so we can't just be talking about operational carbon we've got to attack the embodied carbon and that's what we're doing so uh, our goal is that as a a small builder, we can actually make a difference, uh, especially to our communities uh, that have carbon uh, goals or climate action goals. Um, this is just a shot of the aftermath of the Marshall Fire from our intact houses. And when I saw this picture, um, it singed our flag. I have that flag in my office. 
it bent our flagpole. The, the foundation plantings were burned to a crisp around our houses. And it choked me up when I first saw this, but it's kind of like we're taking a stand as a small company, we're taking a stand on climate change. And our, our hope is that we can make a difference. So that's it, Pete. Okay, well, thank you, Gene. Um, so folks, for questions, just use your, uh, your question pane. And I know we already have a couple up. So Max, uh, I think this one might be for you. It was, it was back during your uh, discussion. Um, can the water conservation tools be local in our communities? And this individual lives in Lafayette, but they have no, no visibility until, of course, that end of month bill. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. You know, we're starting from scratch. You probably can. You'd have to put a, a smart meter on your house somehow. I can't tell you that I'm an expert in how to do that. Um, it's easier for me to work with people like Gene and do those kind of things from the beginning. But, um, you know, you live where you live, so you have the size yard that you do. We're designing the yards, so we're able to, you know, coming from Greenfield has its challenges, but it also has its opportunities because you can paint the painting the way you want it to look. Um, so when you're in an existing environment, you just have to look at what those things are that you can address and, and do your best with them. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, I'll just speak from myself being here in Fort Collins, and I know have many friends at Fort Collins Utilities, including on the water side. And Fort Collins, when they went to smart metering, I can actually look at my water usage if I wanted to on the portal every 15 minutes, and you can get alerts. So it's kind of, I think a lot of that's driven by how progressive your utility is and wanting to give you those tools, um, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you got to wait on others, but. Um, anyway, here is a second question. Um, how difficult is it to do this in an economically viable manner? It seems that this would be make buying in this area ultra expensive. Gene, you want? Well, uh, you know, if we can't, if we can't do this in an economical manner, nobody will buy our houses. Uh, it's our job to find a way to uh, make that happen. One way we're trying to do it is to actually develop local carbon offsets. I mean, Max is really leading the way with the scientists to figure out can we actually use as an offset the improvement we're doing with the soil and carbon capture within on top. And so um, that's a big job. Honestly, and this isn't probably the message. Solar Energy Society wants to hear, but we may be reducing our solar in order to free up money to uh, do less carbon. And honestly, in a world where the grid is greening up, um, uh, I, I'm, que I'm questioning in my own mind whether we need to be putting full net zero uh, arrays on our houses. Uh, if we can uh, redeploy some of those resources to make it more affordable to reduce carbon. Um, I would look at things, you know, from our perspective, from a community development perspective, when we're able to design a community that we can use less land on a home, make that land more efficient, give people a greater experience in the community overall, now your yard, your own house, isn't like the only thing that you have to care about. You know, many communities don't have much of anything else but your house and your yard. But when you create a wonderful community, those things can be reduced in size, which helps with cost. It helps with ongoing maintenance cost. If I've got one quarter the size of yard, I'm using one quarter less water to maintain these things. And we have to bring a system together of the city and parks and a variety of of different partners to to create the kind of environment that is affordable um, like you know for example when i can when i and fort collins and we're unique to this because we have this organization called natural areas when i've got this 150 acres of stormwater, but i have a partner that i can go to in fort collins and say let's partner together here 
you know, we'll dedicate this land or, you know, you can invest in, in some small portion of it. And it's your mission to create natural areas and you have your own revenue source. And we can together make it make 150 acres beautiful and make it an amenity and not just a big bathtub um, and it not cost anything more. So oftentimes what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at how can we think differently about these systems that don't really have much more cost to them, if any at all. But if we just care a little bit more and think a little bit more about them, we can make them better. So it's a constant struggle, but there are many good things that can be done that don't really cost more than normal. Okay, um, next question. Um, can you compare Montava to Saunders, which Gene, you brought up? Gene, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I can do that. Uh, so Saunders is an age-targeted community. The big uh, effort there has been to promote single-level living, thus the ranch plan that uh, I showed as that example. And you know, it's I'll, I'll make this commentary. Um, over the last 30 years, we've worked in a lot of developments. And what I've seen is that master developers have become hedge funds and they're a little bit soulless. And in the past, these master plan communities often had a, a real vision to them because of a passionate developer. Max embodies the passionate developer for setting a new standard for the quality of life. And Bill Swalling is also extremely passionate, but in a much more narrow focus. He's so passionate about uh, aging in place. And so I think uh, both projects bring uh, really different things to Fort Collins, unique things to Fort Collins. And I know Max feels the same way. Um, I, I don't think we feel that uh, Saunders is going to, in a negative way, compete or detract from Montava, and nor do I think Montava will compete or, or detract from Saunders. I agree with that, Gene, and, and I would I'd add a perspective from a developer's um, cities, even people will often put unrealistic expectations on developers. And when you're building a community that has 300 homes, you don't have the scale to do really much of anything other than build homes. It's the reason that within that mile and a half radius that I showed you, there's 9,000 people that live there. They have nothing, literally nothing not a school not a store not a nothing and the reason is it's not the developer's fault it takes scale so the biggest difference between montava and saunders is our scale enables us to create and gives us the responsibility frankly to create the kind of walkability that people want to have that just can't be created on a small neighborhood you know perspective and it's unfair to ask them to because you want to centralize these things so that you can create as much energy as possible so that they have a good chance to succeed. Okay, um, next question. Are there companies doing carbon, carbon neutral building on a larger scale that you've been using as a guide or an example? And how did you calculate the carbon footprint uh, referring to like software programs? So, um, I wish there were someone to follow on this. We're um, and I'm not. I'm not pounding my chest on that. That we're the first. Surely someone else is doing this. We have not found them, and uh, particularly as a production builder, we haven't found them. Uh, and so we're making it up as we go. To be really honest with you, and um, in order to make sure that we are coming to reasonable conclusions. My tech is taking us to the UK to meet with a low carbon builder there and learn how they're uh, benchmarking all of their work. And then we're going to hop over to Sweden. My understanding is that to get a building per permit in Sweden, you need to submit the carbon footprint. And so uh, we're working with DU to come up with the best uh, recommendation for the uh, carbon uh, calculation. Uh, platform for a builder that are, that's available here, and then we're benchmarking it against best practices in the UK and Sweden. 
Uh, here's my hunch. My hunch is that Europe is way far ahead of us. And we may well get uh, a real lesson in humility when we go over there. But what I don't want to do is to publish out a pathway for carbon calculation to the industry if it isn't the best practices uh, globally. And so uh, thank goodness for this uh, great partner who they have contacts in Sweden and contacts in the UK. We don't. And so they, I feel like they kind of adopted us in a way uh, to help us get to the right answers. And it's a work in process. Um, uh, DU is going to publish academic papers about this journey because it's a journey no one's gone down in our industry. And what we're finding is even the ESG uh, check the box kind of prescriptive solution for ESG reporting. It's all about your uh, corporate uh, footprint, but it's almost irrelevant compared to the footprint of our products. And so uh, the templates that are out there don't fit builders very well, in my humble opinion. And uh, we hope to uh, tell the world of our conclusions. I'm sure we'll get pot shots taken at us. They may be right. We may, it may be that we're, uh, that we're, we're not getting uh, the best outcome, but it won't be for lack of training. Okay. Um, next question here. Um, I've read that there are issues with water rights for projects this big. Um, has that been an impact on your plans? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, water, water, water is a huge deal. Um, we've we've purchased enough water to to provide water for everything that's going to be in front of the city of Fort Collins in the foreseeable future, but we're also working on a long-term, very innovative water plan uh, to utilize groundwater and to do that in a very effective and efficient and conservation-oriented way that has many, many benefits. And so as we continue to work through that process for a long-term solution for all the users in Montava, schools, the parks, schools, town center, commercial, everything um, to the people, that's something that we're going to continue to work on. And, yeah, that, that's a long, long story in and of itself. Max could write a book on that that would be a really important book. For anyone. <laughs> It'd trying be really to boring. Be, boring. Trying to be. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, we're, we're in an increasingly water short environment, at least in the West. And these lessons that are hard lessons to learn, I got really hosed on a project. And I didn't have the water handle. I wish I could have read Max first. I will say this, it's an interesting perspective. Assuming we get our water plan approved for the long-term water use, when Montava is completely built out with every water use in the project, we will use half as much water as what's been irrigated on the farm annually, the entire community, for both irrigation and potable use. And that's what you can do when you build a conservation-oriented community, and that's been very intentionally done. Okay, uh, next question. Is it possible to use manufactured or modular housing to do this type of development, or not really feasible? Go first, Gene. <laughs> well, Max, maybe you go to a modular plant in Boise that uh, I've been in a lot of modular plants and it just really honestly looks like a bunch of guys in a house, in a building, in a barn building houses. And that's not what Max showed me. Max showed me the state of the art uh, factory building where they are literally building homes with automotive robots um, and the precision and the quality and, and the humanity of it all. Um, you know, I, I've gotten to know the um, the president of that company, and he came uh, into this new plant with a great deal of compassion for workers. Um, the turnover in a modular plant is a, is incredible because you're basically you've worn your body out if you're just handling a nail gun for eight hours with no breaks. Um, 
you are totally spent at the end of the day. And by the time you hit 40, you're done with uh, a lot of the physical exertion in a job. And so his goal was to use robotics to do all of the stuff that a human should never be asked to do. And as a result, he's opened up his labor force to women. He's got a labor force that's 30% women. You just don't need to be brawny in order to do these jobs. And it was the most eye-opening experience I've seen. Um, I believe that modular from that plant will be used particularly uh, to address the affordable housing needs in Montava. Uh, we're trying to uh, work on an affordable housing project in uh, Breckenridge, 90 unit affordable uh, housing project in Breckenridge that we've been awarded. And we're uh, hoping to uh, do that with modules uh, as you know, the mountains are a high cost area. The labor force is tough. The uh, weather is tough. And so um, we're hoping to make that part of the solution for uh, how to build a great community um, as well as a, uh, a carbon neutral community. That's well said. I'll just add, um, you know, our, our investment team is really um, affordable housing builders who are building a community in Montava. We're not master plan community developers that happen to do affordable housing. Caleb Roop, who's our primary investor, built this half million square foot factory that, that Gene is referring to called Autoval. You can look it up online. The thing I love about what they're doing is that he built it mainly for himself because he builds thousands of affordable housing units per year. A lot of it goes into California. When Gene and I were out there, we were watching them build a transitional homeless 50-unit um, homeless project with triple pane glass and incredible high quality. Every aspect of it was incredible quality, energy efficiency, and it's a homeless project. Um, and Caleb built that plant to support his business, and then he supplements with gaps in the manufacturing process by doing third-party projects that are like 10% of his productivity. The re what you get out of that is incredible honesty from them. They will tell you where the holes are. They will tell you what the challenges are because they're not trying to sell you. You know, they just want the right things to fill those gaps. But um, it's, it's a really unique opportunity for us to think about that technology. And I've been focused on modular or panelization and all the different approaches from the very beginning. Gene and I both have. We spent time with uh, Ted Benson at Unity Homes in New Hampshire, and we've just been thinking about everything we could, and we're going to continue to push that envelope because both of us believe that we're eventually going to land in a place where there's a better way to build houses, and it'll save people, and it'll save money, and it'll make things better for us, even if we're not there yet. So we're just going to keep pressing into it until we get there. Great. A uh, question for Gene. Um, at what point did you decide you could build houses without natural gas? Um, what has been the evolution in this use of fossil fuels within houses? Yep. Well, um, the first house we built that uh, was all electric was the, that award-winning house that I had in the slideshow. And that was in 2020. And what there are a couple of motives. Number one, health. Um, I was uh, tapped to do a so-called debate at the International Builder Show with the fossil fuel industry about uh, getting uh, fossil fuels out of houses. And it didn't quite seem fair. It was me. And then there were these, this team of people from the fossil fuel industry with a PR group. And I mean, it was a, really a lopsided effort. But what really helped me was that the week before that uh, event, uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, issued a report that, uh, that concluded that 40% of the natural gas pollution indoors occurs while the, all of the appliances are in the off position. And if you're a backpacker and you have a, a camp stove, the first thing that you read about that gas stove is don't operate it indoors. Well, guess what? There is no difference in the combustion of a camp stove 
and the combustion of a natural gas range. We just hope that the, their event hood will work and they don't very well. And so I came to the conclusion from a health standpoint that we needed to get the fossil fuels out of the house for the sake of our customers. And then as we move down the uh, carbon reduction path, we need to get it out of the house for the sake of the planet. And uh, I'm a realist. We are an oil and gas producing state. We will never have, in my lifetime at least, I'm pretty old, I'm turning 71 um, on uh, day after tomorrow. And uh, so I don't have that much career to go, I suppose, but um, This, in my lifetime, we will never have some mandate to eliminate natural gas in this state. The pol political interests are too high, the economic interests are too high. But that doesn't mean that a small niche builder like us can't offer this and explain the attributes of a fossil fuel free home to our customers and find enough customers who will buy it. And so um, that's how we got there. And uh, you know, we, we still use natural gas in some of our houses now. By the end of next year, we will be done with natural gas. And oh, by the way, Max has made the decision to not even install gas mains in Montauga. That got the attention of the uh, chairman of the, the State Public Utilities Commission wanting to understand, wow, you know, it really, are, are we to the point where a land developer is willing to uh, take that stand, and I think it's just an important stand to be to be made, and uh, and we're going to have some uh, some headwinds on that. Our customers all watch cable TV, they all watch the cooking shows, they all have these honking commercial gas ranges. We need to educate them of why it's important uh, to get that out of there. Uh, well, here's what we found uh, with this series of homes. Uh, it was the first one that we did. It's 40, 40 houses in the Central Park development, the old Stapleton Airport. Uh, the customer really doesn't care what's going on in the mechanical room. We can do heat pump hot water heaters. We can do uh, heat pumps for heating and cooling. We can go all electric all we want. Uh, we even installed the, for the first time an electric fireplace. And I got to tell you that um, it doesn't look very good compared to a, a gas fireplace or a wood fireplace. 80% of our buyers opted for an option to purchase the electric fireplace. I do not believe an electric fireplace is a market uh, deterrent, but that gas range is a market deterrent and we have a heavy lifting to do to really educate our customers that. Um, with induction cooking, it's faster, it's cleaner, it's better, it's better for you. And uh, that's our job is to uh, put that message out there. Great, um, next question. Um, did you consider or are you considering community solar arrays? Um, and second question, have you considered multifamily or even neighborhood uh, scale ge geothermal like the district geothermal? I'm going to let Max talk about Gene. <laughs> oh, yes. We've been at this a long time. So Gene and I both have been uh, meeting with PRPA, uh, the city-owned uh, power plant, and the city of Fort Collins, um, head of utilities. Poking and prodding, we've got more meetings coming up. The head of utilities for Fort Collins is going to be coming down to Denver and visiting Gene and looking at how his houses are built as we think about you know, how does Fort Collins move to a you know, carbon neutral power production capacity by 2030 and all the things that have to go into that. And so we're there's no easy answers. Um, we've been asking those questions. So I talked in my presentation about the questions we ask ourselves. Does it make sense for us to do community type systems like this for batteries and for solar? And, and how does that play out from an ownership standpoint and an operational standpoint? Um, the benefits to the city, the benefits to the homeowner. 
So we're just in the middle of working through what those, in the middle, I say that we're at the beginning of really working through what those kinds of options might be on a large scale for a community like Montava, but we care about it. So Montava is very dense. It's a, a high proportion of uh, townhomes and multifamily within Montava. And a challenge with rooftop solar is we don't have enough roof area to get to net zero. We would love to be able to do solar gardens. We would love to be able to do community-based uh, solar, but we need a way for the customer to get the benefit of that production. And we sort of are uncovering a lot of hurdles to, uh, uh, to overcoming that problem. But to Max's great credit, he just doesn't stop. You know, it's like, oh, well, then I guess I need to talk to the power plant. And so we were on the phone uh, with uh, PRPA, and they're basically saying, well, we can't do anything without Fort Collins Utility. So Max is on that. So um, I have to tell you that uh, Max, I've never had a developer care as much as Max does. And, and I, I told him to watch a, a documentary called Kiss the Ground About Soil. He has gone so far beyond me on soil that uh, it, it, it's kind of mind boggling, but um, it's why I love him. Okay, um, next question here. Um, what is the plan timeline for Montava? So we're working now to solve the last few big challenges and be able to start the first phase and, and major infrastructure around the first phase in the first quarter of next year. So sometime between December of this year and March of next year. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of things going on with the city. People can keep track of that um, through the city portal and city processes. Okay. So I think I think just to build on that, that if Max starts uh, infrastructure in, in the first quarter of 23, potentially we're starting housing in the fourth quarter of 23, the first quarter of and we'll start. Wouldn't you say, Max? Yeah, the the infrastructure lift from Montava is massive, and so we're a year to a year and a half of infrastructure work before houses can get built. So it'll be first quarter, second quarter of 24 um, before houses really start getting built. Okay, um, I read that the recent climate bill will pay 5,000 per zero net or zero energy ready homes to builders. You're already there, but how much difference does this make to you or to the other builders? Well, it's important. Uh, and by the way, we've had a, ta a tax credit, a renewable energy tax credit that I'm sure your audience knows all about uh, for some time. And sometimes it it expires and then they'll go re reenact it and make it retroactive. It's kind of, we call it the solar coaster, but we're kind of up and down all the time with what's going on uh, with policy. Um, but um, that $5,000, it's a tax credit. It's not a deduction, and that's it's material. Um, what we long for is the ability for a high-performance home to have a level playing field with the big builders. We don't have that. Um, part of its scale, you know, we don't have their cost of funds. We don't have uh, some of their, uh, their scale in order to drive down costs. Uh, but we think the homes we build, the high performance homes that we build are the way all homes should be built. Now I'm not political about it and I don't go around at code committees uh, uh, bashing build other builders or um, I just wanna go do the right thing and hopefully that uh, shows that it can be done. But um, a, a great example would be, we did uh, 271, 80% uh, of area median income, affordable homes in the Central Park development. Their average HER score was 22. They were all EPA and Door Air Plus. Um, 
my belief is that no one needs a high performance home more than a low income family because they need lower operating costs. And so I believe our job, our role in this industry is to show what's possible. And, um, and so anything that helps level that playing field, like the $5,000 tax credit is important, but it's also really important to get other builders to buy in and to adopt. And, uh, you know, we're part of the Energy and Environmental Building Alliance. And, you know, I, it tends to be your buddies around the country that build just like you, but it's not an exclusive club. We're not successful unless the big builders sign on. Uh, and that's when we know that, uh, that big differences can be made. I'll um, kind of circle back to a question that was asked that I didn't answer related to geothermal. Gene knows that I've been a fan of geothermal for a long time, and mainly because the communities that have been a lot of my model communities for urbanist design that Lou Oliver has been involved with, like Serenby and Trillith, are basically 100% geothermal uh, communities. And so I've just been able to experience what that's like and learn about that technology and learn about the efficiencies that that has um, above others. However, there are more challenges. There's other things to it that are more complicated, that add complication to an already complicated scenario. So um, Gene has done a ton of work with Mitsubishi and other companies in the air source heat pump world. And that's where his comfort level has been, frankly. And so we continue to explore this. My hope is that we'll be able to create, I'm gonna be pushing on Gene and working on uh, trying to create a, a test scenario in the first phase of Montava where we build a good chunk of homes with geothermal, a good chunk of homes with air source heat pump and, and they're similar houses and we track how these things do because that's one of the things that I've noticed. We don't really have great data comparing these things to each other, especially in the context of specific homes that are built to specific standards that are those higher level standards that we're doing in Montava. Because um, 100% of the community, single family homes are zero energy ready, committed to be zero energy ready homes. And um, so we're pressing into that world and we'll see where we end up. But it's gotta be something that is affordable, maintainable, manageable as a system. And um, so that's what we're working on. Great. Um, well, here's a question on affordable housing. It's kind of a multi-prong one uh, for Gene. Um, does Thrive have any plans to work with the uh, the Colorado government in either building tiny homes for the homeless or doing other work to um, support those projects, like donating uh, pro bono work volunteers? And then, kind of second part. Uh, do you have a low income set of homes that you are making plans for? Well, I mentioned that we've completed uh, the largest for sale affordable housing project in the state. Uh, that's a 271 unit uh, development that we called Elements. Um, and at that time, I think we were the largest builder of for sale uh, affordable housing uh, in the state. Um, it's dependent upon what I call funding the gap. And here's what I've learned about affordable housing. It always costs more to build than people can afford to pay. And where does that come from? Well, where it came from in Central Park was from the developer because they had a mandate from the city when they bought the airport that 10% of the homes would be available to people at 80% of median income or less. And we were the primary builder of that housing. We've done it in a project as I described. We've done it in mixed income uh, 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 developments where they're blended in with market rate units, which I like the best, but it's pretty hard to get to, to scale uh, that way. And so what's necessary every time is who's going to fund the gap? How is the, the gap going to be funded? And uh, we've worked with the city of Westminster. Uh, we've worked with a number of, we're working with Breckenridge as we speak. And uh, finding the gap is the challenge. And, and we can't do another one unless we find a source of, of the gap. 
And uh, where can that come from? Well, a developer mandates one idea that was the inclusionary housing ordinance in, in Denver. Um, it, it could be a uh, housing authority. Uh, the Summit County Housing Authority looks to be a resource for the Breckenridge project. The city, uh, the town of Breckenridge is donating the land and a subsidy of $50,000 a door. Those are the kinds of, that's the magnitude of dollars it takes to deliver these houses, especially as high performance homes. We have never done rental. And when we're talking about the very low income, like a tiny house uh, development would serve, they almost always need to be rental because the, the customer has no wherewithal to qualify for a mortgage. Um, and so, does that mean we turn a blind eye to homelessness? And uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, we're maybe the largest corporate sponsor, one of the largest corporate sponsors of a statewide a nonprofit called Homemade. We just sponsored their fundraiser uh, last week, their uh, fall uh, or late summer, as it were, fundraiser, and uh, and we we. I think raised about $170,000. That's matched with uh, donations from other builders. And uh, Homemade has built $14 million worth of homeless projects across the state and donated them to our, our state. Uh, the way that works is they always partner with a homeless provider, uh, such as Volunteers of America, uh, the two projects that uh, we'll complete this year that HomeAid's doing are for the Children's Home in downtown Denver, the oldest nonprofit in the state, uh, as well as the Colorado Children's Home up in Longmont. And these are children that have nowhere to go and could be homeless. Um, so um, it's a big part of our DNA to care for all of the housing needs of the state. But um, as a builder, we just haven't been able to play in the poor rent uh, arena because we don't have the capital or the partners uh, to be able to do that. Okay, um, going back to resilience, um, what are you doing specifically to fireproof structures on the property, either Montava or in other cases? Well, the standard that we're uh, adopting is uh, pay attention to the roof. Most of the houses in the Marshall Fire, as we understand it, burn from the top down. Um, we're not fans of rooftop decks. Those units that were right across the street, members got underneath the decking on rooftop decks and, and burned those to the ground. Um, uh, so fire rated roof, fire rate achieving and it's it's no secret it's hardy plank you know we were the first adopter of hardy plank in the state and i demonstrated it down in douglas county in the wooded area by taking a propane torch to a, a piece of uh hardy plank and it glows it never it never combusts airtight construction which is you know a tenant of energy efficiency anyway um, in some of those houses in the Marshall Fire, the embers got inside, uh, particularly up in the attics. And um, so that airtight construction, we think, is a key. And in the past, we just kind of did those things for energy efficiency. And what we're coming around to is an intentionality of uh, making sure that our specifications for each project take that into account. Um, so those are the steps that we're taking. Okay, and I have a kind of a follow-up uh, to that one, um, kind of echoing your, your earlier comments on the Marshall Fire, and, and really the question is, is you know, um, why, is, why is resilience being undersold, um, maybe in the industry, but specifically in the media reporting on that, um, with the comment that, you know, all you heard was, you know, a lot of people saying it's too expensive to build to higher standards. Um, both efficiency and obviously, you know, firewise uh, type of construction. I have a very unpopular opinion about this. Uh, 
I think what we have is a lot of underinsured victims up there. And I think the role of government ought to be to help them get rebuilt. And uh, I was asked to weigh in and testify in Louisville uh, Town Council. And uh, honestly, I would have, my opinion is that they should be focusing on resilient reconstruction more than adopting the net zero uh, addendum to the 2021 code. And that's probably not popular for this audience, but the compassionate, th I thought it was the compassionate thing that our government should serve people. These people are in trouble. And uh, my, be my personal opinion is that we should be finding a way to get good resilient house houses built for them. And uh, uh, making it unnecessarily expensive, I thought was a disservice to their citizens. But um, that's probably not very popular with this group. Well, I can I can tell you some of the discussions we had as a state organization, and and having a lot of friends that, um, some of whom, but what at, at friendly organizations more in the green building side, and even individuals who had lost their homes um as well um it, yeah it's a very that was a very difficult uh situation um and well one of the good things that came out of it was you know ample uh, support it seems from excel and others for those who do want to take those extra steps um i think that's a great outcome uh, that that uh, happened from that we did consult with doe who um uh, I believe is stepping in with assistance as well. Um, they did some uh, testimony in front of uh, the legislature about that. And uh, I think the XL support is great. I know the PUC was instrumental in that. And um, we were asked, why are, why are we not out there rebuilding houses? And the truth is, I don't think we're a good custom builder. <laughs> And uh, the, the, our value proposition is reached by being a production builder where we can drive costs down. And I think we would fail and we would fail our customers uh, if we tried to remake ourselves quickly. Uh, we know some of the builders who are uh, engaged in that. They're very good builders and um, I think they'll do a good job. Okay, um, one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, are there examples in the U.S. where municipalities have either mandated, financially incentivized, or given preference to builders with a similar net zero concept or shall we just say code plus type of approach to building? I've not seen incentives. Uh, we all know what code advancement does and that's the primary tool that I that the municipalities I know of are are utilizing. In a way, I think this five thousand dollar tax credit is the most meaningful incentive uh, that I've seen, and as we, as we all know, that's nationwide. Um, I am interested in a way that we see these carbon reduction goals that cities have uh, adopted, but we haven't seen a lot of policy to make it happen other than the adoption of, of uh, the international building codes. Uh, we all know that there are some laggards out there that are still building on the 2018 code or, or older. Uh, the 2021 code's a really aggressive code and a good code. And uh, my take is that it's gonna start getting much more expensive as in if in 2024 they continue on the, the tra trajectory they're on, but I think that a carrot would be good, you know, not just the stick, but I think a carrot would be good uh, to create incentives uh, to get more uh, builder adoption. You know, we're a niche builder, and um, most of the high performance builders I know around the country are, are all niche builders. This needs to be brought to the mainstream. And, um, you know, they talk about how with affordability, we're going to need all the tools. With climate action, we're going to need all the tools. 
we need all the tools to incentivize big builders to come in and really scale high performance building. And I haven't seen that happen around the country. Okay. Well, uh, Gene and Max, I want to thank you again um, for a great presentation on an exciting project. And I know we're all really, especially those of us here in Fort Collins who've been hearing about this over the last few years, um, really happy to see it moving forward and the example it's gonna it's gonna set. So. I want to thank you both for, for, for joining us and for everyone who attended. Hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll be, should be getting a copy of that, uh, this uh, reporting by email. So thanks and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>